Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Remember to subscribe to our free podcast so you won't miss any of our inspiring content. Here is episode 150. Ideally, we want our children to spend their adult lives in activities and professions they love rather than they're forced into because of a poor education that's too general. Benjamin Franklin once said, Do not curse the darkness, rather light a candle instead. If you're ready to set your mind on fire, then prepare yourself for the Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is Stephen Horwich. Stephen has been a professional educator for over 40 years. He's taught the Master's Writers Program for the University of Southern California and for Los Angeles Unified School District, also in private schools for over 10 years. He then gave up on traditional education and homeschooled his two children. Now as a homeschool advocate, he's authored STEPS, which is a comprehensive homeschooling curriculum for students ages 5 through high school. He's also an Emmy award-winning author of musicals, plays and screenwrites with many credits. He's been <laughs> featured with us a lot on episodes number 40, 60, 73, 74, 75, <laughs> and 83. <laughs> Welcome, Stephen. Oh, I'm so glad to talk to you again. It's fun. It's the beginning of another school year, and I just wanted to, any excuse I could get to catch up with Stephen, because <laughs> you always have such illuminating advice. We're going to talk a little bit more about you know what we can do at the beginning of our school year. So give us, what's your number one advice for parents beginning a new school year? Well, you know, I'm going to kind of... Uh focus in on a, a book I wrote called The Homeschooler's Handbook, which consists of a lot of tools that make homeschooling more viable and better for the student and the parent as well. One of the tools in the handbook, it has to do with the phases that a student passes through when they're studying a certain subject. And basically, we've earmarked four phases. The first thing you have to know is that I believe education is entirely for the student. It isn't for the parent. It isn't for a school district. It isn't for the satisfaction of government standards. It isn't for anybody but the student. They're going to have to live with their education for the rest of their days. So we, as homeschoolers, as educators, we want the homeschool process to really be focused on the interests and the strengths of the student and to be a really rewarding experience for the student. Otherwise, you'll have a recalcitrant student on your hands and very little success. So as homeschoolers, we have this terrific freedom to orient the entirety of the education that we're offering our child around their interest and their needs. And all of these tools that I'm about to kind of walk through, hopefully some of them with your daughter, are intended to make that easier, to make that possible, to make pinpointing the student's interests a quick, easy, painless process overall. Well, and we kind of talked about that. I mean, if you're new to homeschooling and your children have been in a situation where the teacher has been dictating what they want to learn or even a computer program, you know, if you've been working with that kind of system, it is difficult. And that's one of the things that I found when I pulled my kids out and we were using your curriculum. It was really difficult for me to I'll just spur like, what do you want to study? Because it is a very, you know, you give us a framework of what to study, but yet it's not directly said, you know. That's right. That's right. So. Well, because every student is unique and really deserves the opportunity to have the subjects that they elect to study to a very large extent determined by their interests. So it's only so far uh, in developing a curriculum that is intended for math usage. There's only so far I can go in terms of advising you as an individual what your child should be studying. It's my own opinion that there are probably subjects that every child should be exposed to, to a certain extent. Uh, history, science, certainly language skills and reading is the key subject, and then mathematics and a few other subjects. But um, 
you can't dictate from year to year what a student ought to study. The student needs to be able to dictate that to a very large extent so that they remain interested in education and they remain interested in their studies. So with that in mind, the first tool I wanted to discuss, we kind of earmarked four phases a student goes through in studying any given subject. And there's a little bit of a form that we put together so that you know where your student is in each of these subjects. Once they're studying subjects, these are the phases they're going to pass through with each subject, say mathematics or science. The first phase, phase one, is just general education. You should be at the beginning of homeschooling, exposing your student to as many subjects and experiences as you possibly can. It should be broad. It should be general rather than specific, because if you get into specifics, you're into specialization in a certain subject uh, before the student even knows if they're interested in that subject. So general education is phase one, and it's an intended as an introduction to as many activities and subjects as is humanly possible. What you're looking for when you're generally educating, when you're exposing the student to all these subjects, is phase two. Phase two is what I call the aha moment. It's when the student's eyes light up or the student says, hey, I really like this, this subject, this activity. This is something I'm interested in. Uh, that's when you've entered into phase two because you've had this aha moment where you've discovered something that the student is interested in or the student has discovered something that they're interested in. Phase three once you know a subject that the student has expressed some kind of interest in that, that is valuable to the student, you then pour on the coals on that particular subject. This is phase three. You provide every opportunity to have exposure to that subject in a structured way, in an unstructured way, uh, unstructured way, depending on how you like to educate. I prefer a little bit of structure to education, but not everybody does, which is why I wrote a curriculum. But you provide the student as many hands-on and study opportunities to experience that subject as possible after they've expressed an interest. And while you're doing that, you're aiming to the last phase. What happens is if the student remains interested in that subject, you get to a point where they'll be teaching themselves. You won't need to be providing necessarily curriculum or experiences because the student will be demanding them. The student will be doing their own research. The student will be deciding in a very real sense in what manner they wish to study or be exposed to that particular subject. And the moment the student is teaching themselves, you've arrived at that final phase in education, particularly as a homeschooler. And that is the easiest phase for both the parent and the student as homeschoolers. The parent is largely off the hook because the student is motivated. The student is determining the structure of their education based on the subjects they're interested in and their own increasing understanding of what they know and what they don't know about that subject because they'll demand more information and more exposure to the subject. Then that's when it gets easier for you as a parent because you're not guessing anymore, the student isn't guessing anymore, and you're both rowing the boat in exactly the same direction. So you're always trying to get to say, uh, phase four on any subject that you're studying. Uh, again, phase one is just general education, vast exposure to subjects, general. Phase two is the aha moment where the student expresses interest in a subject or a particular activity. Phase three, you keep exposing the student to that particular subject. You really pour it on. Phase four, the student knows enough and is interested enough to become self motivated and driven and they take over their education at that point in that subject. What I have is this very simple form where you you indicate where the student is in terms of these four phases in each subject that they're studying. So if you know they're studying you know mathematics but they don't like it because they really haven't found something in math they love yet, you're still at phase one at least as far as mathematics is concerned. It's just an overall view of math. If there's an aha moment, hey, I like theoretical physics, you know, mathematics, and you have that aha moment, then you pour on the coals and you're into phase three until the student just grabs it with both their hands and runs with it without your help anymore. 
I think it's important to know where you are in each subject. If you're starting homes today, you probably should consider that you're generally at phase one until the student makes it very clear they love a certain subject. And it's a mistake to assume that they love a subject because you've seen them do it before. It doesn't mean that today, as a homeschooler, they still do. Wow. Well, and they can move through different phases. I mean, they can show an interest, right, in something and really dive into it and then maybe lose interest and or maybe gain interest in another way is what I should say. They don't necessarily lose interest. Boy, absolutely right. You're the one thing you are absolutely sure of as a parent educating a child is that they're going to change their mind and they're going to change their mind many, many, many times during their education. So if they're interested in animation today, that doesn't mean they will be six months from now. Even if they're enjoying the experience, there may be other subjects that interest them more. They may get tired of it. They're, they may come back to it a year from now, want to break from it. Yeah, and that's why we talk about doing that phase one, two, three, four for each subject. We ask the, the parent to do that every month with every subject because their interests will change. But then we have other tools to help narrow down what is the student's interest. Now, how old is it's your daughter, right, that we're yeah. going to talk about? Yep. And how old is she? She's 11. She'll be 12 in October. So. <laughs> and, what, and what is her name? Emily. Emily. So what I would like to do with Emily, if that's okay with you, is I have a number of questionnaires that you ask the student to do. And I'd like to walk her through a few of these, and it will help maybe narrow down some of the subjects she might be interested in. Okay. That sounds great. All right. So, Emily, uh, can you say hello? Hi. Hi, how are you, Emily? Good. Good. So all I'm going to do is ask you these questions about different subjects, and I'm going to ask you to decide which ones you're interested in, okay? Okay. (laughs) She's shaking her head, but... Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just talk to me. That's fine, because people want to hear your answers, too. And um, so basically... I want you to give each thing that I ask now either a one, a two, or a three. If you absolutely love the subject, give it a three. If you're kind of interested, give it a two. If you hate the subject and don't ever want to learn anything about it as long as you live, give it a one, okay? All right, so this first one is all about different sciences, different studies in science, and I'm going to ask you how you feel on a scale of one to three, three being you love it, one being you hate it, what you think of each of these sciences, it would help us narrow down what you're interested in right now. All we want to know is what are you interested in right now, not yesterday and not tomorrow, just now. So the first one is geology, which is uh, what the earth is made of and how it was made and how the earth works. So where would you rate that as far as your interest? Uh, probably a two. Okay, good. So I'm going to write this stuff down, and your mom should write it down, because this is going to help her figure out which sciences you might want to study. The next one is oceanography. It's the study of the ocean and the animals that live in it and how the ocean works. Uh, two. Okay, good. Next is a subject called meteorology, which is the study of weather and air. Probably a two. <laughs> okay, good. all right, good. Uh, next is biology, which is the study of life and living things. Probably a three. Oh, okay, good. Next is zoology, which is the study of animals. That would be a three. Okay, good. And you seem pretty sure of that one, too. Uh, next is botany, which is the study of plants. Uh, two. Okay, good. Next is anatomy, the study of the human body. Uh, three. Okay. Next is astronomy, the study of stars and planets in space. That one's a three. Okay, and you seem sure of that one, too. Next is chemistry, the study of what things are made of and how they're made. Uh, three. Okay, good. Next is physics, the study of the laws of motion that govern all the objects in the universe. Two. Okay, good. Next is engineering, the study of how we use science to build things like buildings. Uh, Two. Okay, good. Next is ecology, the study of how living things work with the world around them and change it, how we change the environment and how we live with the environment. 
too. Okay, good. Next is medicine. We're almost done with this list. Medicine is, you know what medicine is, the study how, of how we use science to keep people healthy. Three. Okay. And the land, uh, no, there's two more. Aerodynamics is the study of how things fly. Three. Okay, good. And last is paleontology, the study of ancient living things uh, and what they tell us about what life was like long ago planet Earth. Three. Okay, good. So that's it for the science questionnaire. Yeah, science I'm gonna, is one of her favorite subjects. I, <laughs> boy, I got three. it. I, I got it. And you have a lot of threes there, which gives you a lot of room as a parent to really provide her a hands-on opportunity to study areas of science she's specifically interested in yeah. instead of wasting her time with areas she is not. All right, here's the next questionnaire. You ready? Mm -hmm. This one is about PE, Okay. It's the same thing. If you love something, give it a three. If you hate it, give it a one. Uh, the first one is exercise, like push-ups, sit-ups, pull-ups. Three. Good. Running. A two. Okay. Swimming. Two. Okay. Roller skating. Three. Good. I Ice skating. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm writing it too. Ice skating. Three. Okay, very good. Skateboarding? One. Okay. Dancing? Three. All right. Riding a bicycle? Three. All right. <laughs> riding a... I've got it all. Riding... I'll send it... Riding a horse? Three. Okay, good. Uh, weight lifting. Do you know what that is? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Two. Okay. Gymnastics? One. Okay. Playing basketball? One. Okay. Playing baseball? Two. Okay, cool. Playing football? One. Playing soccer? One. Good. Playing tennis? One. Good. Playing golf? Uh, one. Okay. And martial arts like karate? Two. All right. Very good. So... We've, well, that's it for the PE. And what we would do is we would look at where did you give these things a three and we'd focus what you do as a homeschooler on your threes, on the things that you're most interested in. All right, now we're going to do another questionnaire. Let me get it up on the computer. Give me just a second. All right, so this is called uh, more subjects, right? And the first part of it, and again, it's the same thing. Three means you love it. One means you hate it. This is for the arts now. So the first one is acting. Acting. Uh, three. Okay. Singing. Two. Good. Dancing. You already gave that a three earlier, so I'll just put it in there. Painting. Three. All right. Photography. Three. All right. Filmmaking. Making movies. Three. Okay. Drawing. Three. Very good. I see we found an area she really liked. <laughs> uh, writing. Three. Very good. Uh, playing instrument. Three. Okay. Writing music or songs. Uh, one. Okay. The history of music. Two. All right. Animation. Making cartoons. Uh, two. All right, and the last one on this list is sculptures, you know, working with clay and stone. Three. Wow. All right, we found an area she loves. Yeah. All right, the People next... The arts. <laughs> obviously. Uh, the next list, well, we're in the same boat on that. That's where what I've done my whole life. These are three things having to do with learning about the world. Uh, the first one is studying current events. What's happening in the world right now? Um, two. Okay, good. Then civics, which is learning about your country, your state, or your city. Two. Okay. And then global causes, uh, learning about what problems there are in the world and how to solve them. Two. Okay, good. Now, the next list, I'm going to get out another sheet of paper, 
has to do with things you would do with your hands, work you would do with your hands. The first one is working with computers to write programs and create things. Uh, one. Okay, good. Uh, the next is building things using electronics. Two. Okay, good. Next is building engines, like a car engine. Two. All right. Next is building robots. Um, two. Okay. Next is gardening. Uh, that's three. Okay. Sewing. Three. All right. Cooking. Three. All right. Running a library. Running a library. Three. Oh, okay. Building buildings. Putting up buildings. Three. Wow. Raising animals and caring for them. Three. Yep. <laughs> Farming. Raising plants. Three. Okay, good. Now, the next group has to do with money and business. So the first one is studying the stock market. Um, one. Okay, because you don't care. Uh, <laughs> Next is managing a business. Two. All right. Next is how to promote and market things, how to sell things. Two. All right. Next is politics, like running for president. One. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's it for that. There are special things you can do, and there's just a few of these. The first one is exploring space, its history, and the science of space exploration. Three. Yeah, I figured. Sailing a boat. Three. All right. Flying an airplane. Three. Okay. <laughs> uh, driving a car. Two. Really? <laughs> wow. Riding a horse. Three. Okay, good. Now, so far we've covered all this. There's one more questionnaire I'm going to give you, and then we'll look at some general questions. So is this fun for you? Mm, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's going to help your mom figure out what to have you study here. Uh, so this is a questionnaire on what do you want to learn. All right. And these are not things you give a one to a three. You just answer these questions uh, with your own words. That's what this one is. So the first question is, do you like learning? Not just school, but learning. Yeah, I really like learning. Okay, good. Uh, the next question is, what do you like to learn about? Um, I like science a lot. I guess so. Yeah, anything else? And all right, science in the arts, anything else? Mm, not really. Okay, good. <laughs> next is, what do you not like to learn about? Um. I don't know. I don't really is there is there any subject you really really don't like that you really hate having to do? No. Okay, that's perfectly fine. The next one is, what do you like about the way you do school? Now you're homeschooling, so what do you like about that? Um, I like that we can read a lot and that we can learn about whatever we want to learn about. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. And what do you not like about homeschooling? I don't know if he, she dares answer this. With like, <laughs> no, she, she needs to answer because that's an area you may need to fix. Now, she may not have an answer, and that's perfectly fine. But if she does, it's something for all of you to talk about. Do you like not hanging out with your friends all day? No, she's fine with that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Maybe the guesswork of what you want to no, say. No, 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 no. <laughs> no I can't coach her. <laughs> no. One, one of the rules of these is there is absolutely no coaching given. It's we're interested in the student's thinking. And if she doesn't have anything particularly, that's absolutely fine. Nothing. She's shaking her head. <laughs> All right. So we're, we're going to move on. The next question is, is it fun to read sometimes? I already know your answer. Yes. <laughs> yes. Do you read well? Yeah. Yes. Do you feel, yeah, I, of course, feel that it's easy for you to learn from reading? Uh, yeah. Yep. And you know, there are some people, it is not easy for them to learn reading. So I know for you it is. What do you like about being a student? I don't know. 
<laughs> you don't have to have an answer. It's, it's absolutely all right. We're just trying to figure out how to best help you really win at your education. Well, um, maybe this is coaching, but one of the things that she talked about is she likes to fill in like um, worksheets. And, okay. you know, that those are harder to find when you're not like in a boxed, you know, yeah. curriculum type thing. Yeah, that's true. That that really is true. Um, so there are a lot more questions here, and some of them are really key questions. Like, let me ask you this one. If you could do anything with your free time, the time you do not use for study, what would it be? Um, dance. <laughs> oh, wow. See, Mom, she's telling you something yeah. here. <laughs> right? Exactly right. It's exactly right. Let's see. Is there any? Well, that's fine. All right. So you know what? Let's let her go. Okay. And, and you and I can continue from there. It's hey, fun. Emily, thank you very much, Emily. You're welcome. Thanks <laughs> for having me. Oh, it's, it's great. Absolutely. <laughs> that was so, fun. <laughs> so, Rebecca, there are more questionnaires. There are quite a few more questionnaires. But listen, what did you and I just figure out about your daughter? That she likes if we science look at and it, arts, right? She lo- but, but we know more than that. We know that in the area of science, she's very interested in animals. She's interested in zoology. She's interested in biology. These are things that interest her. And she's interested in astronomy and space. There were two areas in science that she really jumped on. Um, you know, you, you don't just look at the answer, but look at how she answered. It was zoology and astronomy that really immediately got a yes from her. And, and I think that's valuable to know. If you were a homeschooler and you did not know what your students' interests were because they had been going to public or private schools for the last five years or whatever, and you were trying right at the beginning of the homeschool year, where we are right now, to assess what studies to give your child, which every homeschool parent has to figure out and ideally orients it around the child's interest, then these kind of questionnaires become absolutely invaluable because they are telling you, your kid is telling you, these are the subjects I want to study. And if you want them to love homeschooling, you will predominantly build their studies around the subjects that they're telling you they want to know about. Before we go on, let's listen to this message. Hey, Firestarters, are you looking for a new way to listen to the Luminous Mind? Try listening on Stitcher. Haven't heard of Stitcher? Think of it as radio on demand. You can listen to the Luminous Mind anytime, anywhere. There is no downloading, no syncing, no wasted memory. Just stream your favorite podcasts such as The Luminous Mind. Stitcher is available on iOS, Android, Nook, iPad, and also from your favorite internet browser. Don't have Stitcher? Download it free today at Stitcher.com or in the App Store. And make sure you rate and review The Luminous Mind so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. Mind with Stephen Horwich, helping answer the problem of education. Well, and some parents might be really worried about not hitting all the bases. What would you say to that type of parent that's afraid that, you know, if we just study zoology and astronomy, that she won't ever want to do some of the other things? The question has a complicated answer. Let me see if I can kind of narrow it down. First of all, I think that a student should be exposed to as many subjects as possible. That's part of that first phase of general education, you know, being exposed to many subjects, because the student doesn't always know what they're interested in until they're exposed. You may have a student who really doesn't know they're interested in a particular science until they're given a little bit of that science to study. So general education, a broad stroke education, is a very important step in education, and it should not be ignored entirely 
based on the interest of the student today. And you want to remember that Emily's answers just now, those are her answers today. They may not be her answers three months from now. They may not be her answers a year from now. They may not be her answers a week from now. So because she may discover a subject that really, really interests her, and then you're off to the races on that particular subject. But these kinds of questionnaires tell us is what they're interested in today. Does it mean that she should not study mathematics? No, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that. But it does mean that you don't necessarily have to drive her through eight years of homeschool math if it's not a subject that interests her. Let her take her time and get through the math that she needs to survive life, which does not include things like geometry and calculus and even algebra. Let her get the basic mathematics required to live her life and focus her time and energy on the things she's going to spend her life doing. Ideally, we want our children to spend their adult lives in activities and professions they love rather than they're forced into because of a poor education that's too general. What we're trying to do as homeschoolers is start out with a form of general ed that exposes them to many subjects and then narrow it down and narrow it down and narrow it down until as they get a little bit older, they're principally, not entirely, but principally studying the subjects they want to spend their lives practicing. If we do that, we're greatly facilitating that child's future and they will love their education. If you don't do that and enforce eight years of math on a kid who hates math and eight years of history on a kid who hates history, say, you know, if you don't narrow it down to the subjects they're interested in eventually and predominantly, mostly provide those subjects with their study time, you're not doing the student any service as a homeschooler where we have the freedom to ignore standards. We don't have to do what schools do. We don't have to do what the government insists public education does or even what private education does. We can educate our children along lines that they will find useful as they get older because they're telling us that's what they want. The rest of it, they do need to be exposed to a certain extent. You know, you have to learn how to read or you can't study any subject. You have to know enough math to balance your checkbook and handle your life and the mathematics that are a part of everyday life. You have to know those things. But above and beyond consumer mathematics, a lot of people, including myself, don't have a lot of use for any kind of advanced math. And it wouldn't be, if I were a student today, a choice I would make to spend many years in a math program. I, I wouldn't be interested, and I would not necessarily do well at that. I'm more like your daughter. I, I would insist on the arts and science and history. Those would be the subject, and literature, those would be the subjects that would really get me going. But everybody's different, and you want to facilitate your students' needs. Well, and I really do love focusing on things that the kids are going to use. I actually just posted on uh, the Luminous Mind Facebook group about how colleges are now saying, I mean, kids are coming to college not knowing some basic skills of just living, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and that's really frustrating. I mean, they may know how to do some of those higher math, but if you, they can't balance their own checkbook or, you know, they can't live, be able to grocery shop even, you know, some of those minor things that yeah. kids just don't understand how to do. Yeah, we cover all that in steps in our curriculum. I, I have to tell you, there used to be a study called consumer math. I usually advise students to use a specific consumer math book that has been out of print for 30 years. You have to go out on the internet and find this book that's been gone for 30 years. And each lesson plan is a hands-on, practical, living your life math experience. Go to a store and shop for tires for your car. You know, do comparative shopping, three different stores. It's a great book. Uh, I can send it to you, the, uh, the name of the book. And that is the kind of experience as colleges wish students had. Listen, there's a reason why when you go to a college, you have to spend your first two years doing what they call general education. It shouldn't be that way. By the time you get to college, you should be allowed to and able to study in a specialized area that you're interested in so that the college experience is kept short to the point and productive. Instead, they're forced to, or at least they feel they're forced to, give you two years of general education because they're not teaching these things in high school. 
you're not getting your math well enough, your science well enough, your history well, all the basic educational essentials. They're not going in in junior high and high school, middle school and high school. It's not happening. Schools aren't doing their job. So now, you know, unless they're homeschoolers who tend to get better educations in general and score better in all the testing, if it's not a homeschooler, the college is forced to, compelled to, do two years of wasted money and time for everybody on general ed before you can start to specialize. Yeah, that is true. And we're seeing a lot of that with students that don't really know what they want to do, but they go to college because that's what they've been told they have to do in order to be successful. So it's great. And I think we've talked that's about right. that before, but is there well, more you want to discuss with your homeschoolers handbook? No, I want to discuss more about Emily. Okay. So, <laughs> so here, here's what I saw. I'll do and, that. And and, and tell me with this questionnaires that we just, and there are more questionnaires. And I think since you have the homeschoolers handbook, walk your children through these questionnaires. It doesn't take very long. You'll probably just have confirmed what you already know about your children because you're a very attentive parent. But if you are new to this, I, I'd love for you to have the experience of doing the questionnaires anyway. If you were new to all of this, and I'm going to show you a different questionnaire that is for you as a teacher. If you were new to this and you were trying to figure out what to give your kids to study, this is a very valuable experience. If I were giving your daughter PE right now, I would give her dancing, dancing, and dancing. Yeah, that's what she does. Dancing. Right, because she because it's for her <laughs> arts, and it does count as PE. Even the state counts it as uh, physical education. I would give her that. Yeah. But clearly the arts and sciences are her areas. And in the arts, she's interested in everything, everything. So you get to have the fun of exposing her to acting and dancing and painting and filmmaking and drawing and writing. All of these things, she scored a three. She's interested in all kinds of things. But what she's not interested in, particularly at this moment in her life, is what's happening in the world. That she was lukewarm about. <laughs> Current events, civics, all that stuff did not interest her. When it came to working with her hands, she was kind of interested in the home stuff, gardening, sewing, and cooking all scored threes, right? Well, you're homeschooling, and that's all part of consumer economics and home economics as a subject. Remember when we used to study home ec in school? And, you know, you would study how to run a household, and you would learn how to do these things. Your daughter is interested in those things. That's great. She's also interested in animal husbandry because she was interested in zoology, very interested, and she mentioned it again in this list. One of the reasons we do multiple lists is to kind of compare. She gave us the same answers to certain things repeatedly, and it's very clear that's where her interests lie. She doesn't care about business at all or politics, but she was interested in, in those specific subjects, and we know that for a fact. Now, Mom, I'm going to give you a questionnaire. Okay. It's called the Ideal Educator Questionnaire. All right, let me find it in my little book here. It's not a little book, unfortunately. It's a, <laughs> a great, great big book. Well, and why you're looking for that, we actually have that linked up on our website already. It's a handbook. It's a it's a step by step walkthrough of how to successfully educate. It's a massive book. It's three hundred pages, and and it's the distillation of you know forty some odd years as an educator. Here's what will work for you as a homeschooler and get you good result. Now I'm going to give mom the the quiz. Are you ready, mom? Yep. All right. Now this is called the ideal educator. You're going to answer questions on a scale of one to five. One being I'm not good at this at all, or I don't even have this quality three being I'm good but I'm not great and five being I am super mom when it comes to this thing okay okay and we add up the score at the end and we see how much do you need to be better as an educator if you're going to homeschool I'm excited to do this because <laughs> <laughs> are you ready yes all right so this is on a scale of one to five one being you're terrible at it five being you are super mom the educator would understand that the education provided is for the student, belongs to the student, and must be desired by the student. I'll probably say a four because I'm okay. I recognize that, but implementation's harder for me. <laughs> yeah, and and for everybody, yeah. and for everybody. Here's the next one. 
The educator would respect the student's every effort. He or she would be willing to listen to the student, watch him, learn about the student from the student, would know what the student considers important, and would make sure the student is protected and nurtured and uh, willing to accept that the student's future is more important than their present because it belongs to them. Yes, I would do four. I'm possibly up there five, maybe. <laughs> well, let's give you a five. Give yourself, don't be hard on yourself. A great educator would express true admiration easily, perhaps effortlessly, often and genuine enthusiasm. Yes, I'm good at that. <laughs> So what are you going to give yourself? I'm going to give myself a four. <laughs> okay, good. I always say there's room to improve, but I definitely... No, 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 no. There's no such thing as perfect, but it's fine to give yourself a five. <laughs> a great educator would not need to be expert in any subject taught, but would need to be quite literate and understand the materials being used so thoroughly as to be able to assist the student when needed. I am probably more of a three in that. I need to study the subjects a little better. Okay, or understand the materials you're using to teach the subject. Yes. Right. All right, good. The educator would need to know how to research using the Internet and other tools to assist the student as needed and would need to be literate. I'm four in that. Very good. I'm there, the but ideal, not quite. <laughs> all right. The ideal educator would need to understand how to be a student, him or herself, so that they could quickly learn an idea or skill that the student may be struggling with in order to help them. I'm a five in that. I love to study on my own, so. Perfect. The educator would reject completely. Now, this is a particular point you and I agree on. The educator would reject completely the tools and methods in current use in favor of the student and his actual needs and desires. Yes, I'm definitely uh, five in that. <laughs> yeah, yes, exactly. The ideal educator would not require any training, though experience isn't a bad thing so long as it is along the lines described just now, right, that it's about the student. Yeah. No degree need to be attained by the educator, little or no experience, that's okay. Credentials, how about a happy student who's learning all kinds of useful things and is excited about his life, right? Yeah, yes, I'm a five on so, that. So exactly right. The ideal educator would be creative. They could look at a subject to be taught and form an interesting way to communicate it to the student. Perhaps right here, right now, quick, quick, quick. I'm probably more of a two in that. That's why I like a curriculum. <laughs> yeah, me too. Me too. The ideal educator would be an excellent organizer and administrator. Paperwork, lesson plans, attendance, workspace, all in order. Spit spot, as Mary Poppins would say. Uh, probably a three in that. I let my kids take over their desks and sometimes the papers and stuff take over. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, that's cool. The ideal educator would have physical health and stamina. Yes, I'm five in that. <laughs> Very good. The ideal educator would respect the family of the student. Well, you are the family of the yeah. student. She would, so you would respect the family's beliefs and what they want without, you know, necessarily succumbing to them. You would respect it. Yeah. Well, we've even talked about that, you know, definitely with my own religion. I feel it's important for me and my kids go. Yeah. But if they chose something else, I would respect that. All right. So we're going to give you a five. Yeah. A five. The <laughs> ideal educator would thoroughly understand the goals of the student, his family, and those of the state for the student, as well as his or her own goals for the student, and would creatively, wisely find the path of least resistance in terms of the pursuit of the student's goals. Yes, least resistance is good, right? <laughs> I agree so, with what that. do you give your? <laughs> I'd say a four. <laughs> okay, good. The ideal educator would understand well the resources provided by the community and by others and would integrate them into the student's education. Uh, probably a four. I mean, I could study things a little better, but I have a pretty good grasp of what's going on around me. All right, good. We have about five more of these. Ideal educator would take the long view of the student's education and know that education is not a race. There is a long game in education, the view where the student will be a year from now, three years from now, even 10 years years from now i'll say a five i was yep. actually thinking that yesterday when i was at church and going okay well my son lacks in this and this but i'm like okay but that's not necessarily the important things right now so that's exactly right the ideal educator would also understand that there is a short game in education the work to be accomplished this hour this day this week this month would be clear in the educator's mind so there's no stumbling around about what to do now oh i'm probably that's probably my hardest thing right it's probably two on that. 
<laughs> okay. The ideal educator would guide rather than teach, allowing the student to discover for himself the world, the truth, information, always making it easily, readily available. I'm a four on that. Cool. The ideal educator would be ever on the watch for opportunities which the student could benefit from, experiences that could expand the student's understanding and skill set. I'm a four on that, too, because I keep my eyes yep. open. <laughs> yeah, I know you do. The ideal educator would not threaten a student in any way, not with tests, grades, punishments of any kind. <laughs> I'm probably a three in that. I'm I'm pretty good at it. I'm definitely more hands on than I used to, or hands off when I used to be. But it's harder, yeah, when you're a parent. It, 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 uh, listen, I had a hard time with that one. Uh, and you know, it was always about testing and grading, testing and grading, always. Uh, I now today, if I were homeschooling my kids, I wouldn't have any problem with it at all. But when I did, it was tough. Uh, finally, the ideal educator would know just how great they are at educating a child and would recognize fully their value to the student, the community, and the future. I'm probably a three in that. I feel confident, but yet I know I could learn more, you know. All right, now I'm going to add up your score. Ready? Okay. Nine, right, so <laughs> let's see, give me a minute. Nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 25, 30, 35, 36, 37, 38, 9, 40, 50, 58, 63, sports, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48, 49, 50, 51, 52, 53, 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74, 75, 76, 77, 78, 79, 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, 85, 86, 87, 88, 89, 90, 91, 92, 93, 94, 95, 96, 97, 98, 99, 100, 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, 112, 113, 114, 115, 116, 117, 118, 119, 120, 121, 122, 123, 124, 125, 126, 127, 128, 129, 130, 131, 132, 133, 134, 135, 136, 137, 138, 139, 140, 141, 142, 143, 144, where you aren't so strong so that, you know, if you take that test and you score, you know, six points, you're not an educator in any way, shape or form. And you should not be trying to educate your kids. If you take the test and you're, you fall in an average range, you know that you can probably help them in a lot of ways, but there are probably areas you in order to help them. And if you don't, you will be limited in how much help you can provide your kids. Your kid's education as a homeschooler begins and ends with you as a parent, as an educator. If you can't help them at all, if you're unwilling to help them, which this test would reveal, uh, you know, a lot of unwillingness to focus education on the kid and that kind of thing. If it's really not your thing, then homeschooling is going to be very hard for you unless you find somebody else to help your kid. Well, and we've kind of discussed this before. I mean, parents do come with an idea of what their child's education looks on based on their education. Do you have any tips for maybe mm -hmm. somebody that wants to be a homeschooler but is finding them, you know, that they're falling short in these areas? Oh, I sure do. Uh, first of all, go ahead and homeschool by all means, because it's my opinion that almost anybody can educate their own children and do a far superior job than a public or a private school will do. That's number one. Number two, remember that you do not have to have an outstanding or even working knowledge of any of the subjects being taught so long as you either use curriculum that does do that for you and that you can utilize as a tool to provide that part of the education to your child or you bring in somebody else who has some kind of working knowledge of the subject and can take your student the next step. But at no point should you assume as a parent that you know less than a public school teacher. You do not know less than a public school teacher. Public school teachers are not educated in the subjects that they are teaching. They don't have degrees in history or science or whatever it is that they're teaching in junior high and high school. They have degrees in education. They are taught to use tests and evaluations and grades and specific tools that do not work in order to quote unquote educate children. So they don't have a spectacular amount of expertise in the subjects they're teaching, I knew a lot of public school teachers who were reading the textbook one chapter ahead of the kids in order to be able to teach the subject. You cannot do worse than that. You can't. So don't assume ever that you're incapable of knowing enough about how to teach your kids. You know your kids. You know what their strengths are and their interests. These questionnaires can help with that, but you know your kids better than anyone. And you are absolutely, if you are reasonably literate and willing to learn yourself, willing to put in the time, you can successfully homeschool.
Yeah. Well, and even if you struggle in areas, there's plenty of help if you keep your eyes open or in the community yep. to do those things. So uh, yeah, great. absolutely. Great advice. Yeah. So how does our audience go about getting your home scores handbook? How can they find that? Uh, <laughs> uh, you go to uh, uh, stepsad.com. Okay. All right. And it's Steps, for sale. S-T-E-P-S ed. Yeah, it is for sale. And for and sale uh, we do have we do have free resources uh, on the site, uh, some of them. We just right now we have a free journal that kids can do that's a, a week of free elective study in history and science and all kinds of the arts, all kinds of subjects. And it's a lot of fun and it kind of is an, a way to expose a child to what we do. But the homeschoolers handbook specifically is for sale on the site and is a very, very, very useful tool for either a person new to homeschooling or even for somebody who's homeschooled for years and is looking for ways to improve the experience. Great. Well, and that's what I wanted to do is to kind of come on and talk about this and hopefully get parents excited and find some tips and stuff for to get them started. Do you have any final parting words for us? And then give us your <laughs> contact information and how we can get in touch with you. Uh, you can always write me through stepsed.com. It's steven at stepsed.com. Uh, I respond to everybody who writes me very quickly. But yeah, I mean, the parting words are this, folks. You should absolutely be homeschooling your children. It's the bottom line. If you want them to be safe, you know, public education, schools, they're not safe. And safety is the parent's first responsibility uh, to their kids. Keep them safe. If you want them to receive a strong academic education, the overwhelming likelihood is that unless your child is very motivated, public school will not provide. And private schools are not a whole lot better as a rule. So you are, as a homeschooler, helping to keep your children safe and to receive an actual education. Colleges are actively canvassing for homeschoolers now. Universities, major universities, actively canvassing because they know that homeschoolers are better educated and better quote unquote socialize they get along better with people better <laughs> than uh, kids who go to public and private schools who are basically scared for their lives a lot of them half the time so uh, you know, that's no way to be social yeah exactly <laughs> yeah well, and as always, it is absolute pleasure to talk to you. I always find our conversations so stimulating and you're so helpful. So again, his contact information is Stephen at stepsed.com. However, we're going to be sure to link up all of the information that we've discussed today on our website. Thanks so much, Stephen, for joining us and once again, <laughs> helping to light our minds on fire. Oh, yeah, it's my pleasure. I'm, I'm always glad to talk to you, Rebecca. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. To learn more about Stephen Horwich, go to our show notes at theluminousmind.net. Be sure to become a subscriber to our free email list and get our new monthly newsletter. Then check out our services tab to see how we can continue to assist you, our fire starters. Also, to help us continue production of inspiring content, go to the sponsor tab at theluminousmind.net for more information on sponsorship and affiliate programs. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, Google+, Pinterest, and now Instagram. Get our free audio content by subscribing on YouTube, iTunes, and Stitcher. To help us grow, consider these easy ways. Tell your friends about us. Leave us a review. Share our content. Tell us how we can help you so together we can continue to light minds on fire and change the paradigm of education. <laughs>